Kerry Wedler is a content creator who focuses on breaking through authoritarian programming to promote peace, freedom, decentralization, and the evolution of consciousness. She previously worked as a journalist and editor-in-chief for the now banned Anti-Media, an independent news organization. She takes special interest in the intersection of spirituality, self-ownership internally and externally, and voluntarism as a path forward for humanity. And in 2008, she voted for President Obama. <laughs> it's not part of your bio, but I just <laughs> wanted to throw in there. So tell me how you went from, in 2008, voting for Obama to where you are now being a self-proclaimed voluntarist. Cool. Yeah. So I grew up in Los Angeles, which is very liberal, progressive. And I think like a lot of people there, I like to think of myself as revolutionary and anti-establishment. And I wasn't like being an authentic. That's how I felt. But I really fell for the Obama propaganda, which is that he was coming change, right? Like hope and change. He was going to change the system. And I did not do any due diligence. I just believed the words he said, you know, like a good statist citizen and voted for him, like went back to my business, didn't pay attention. And at some point I felt I just felt kind of dumb. Like maybe I should know what's going on because I grew up in an environment where it's like democracy is the best system and mm. you should be an informed citizen and do your civic duty. And I felt irresponsible. So I started just looking into his policies and what he'd done. And every reason that I had supported him, he had violated. Mm -hmm. He had been inauthentic. He had continued all the wars. He was starting new wars. He was such a corporatist. Was and it I, the anti-war piece that was the biggest one That was for the you? biggest piece. Yeah. I had always been anti-war. And I was growing up around 9-11 in the Iraq war and mm -hmm. Afghanistan. And I was just inherently, I had this sense of like initiating violence is wrong, mm -hmm. which became really important as I moved toward volunteerism. And a more freedom oriented mentality, but I, I got really angry first. And then I started evolving towards like Ron Paul and I liked his rhetoric and what he had to say. I liked his philosophy. Really. Mm. It came down to peace and it wasn't, it took a couple more years seeing Ron Paul getting, you know, discarded and, and mistreated by the media and realizing like no one who could change the system is ever going to be put in a position of power. It's just not going to happen. And that's when I started taking this idea of peace to a much more holistic level. Like, it's not just about war. It's about the way the entire system functions, which is through violence. And not just it's initiating violence. That's where all of their authority comes from. It's compliance and violence. And that's when I just completely rejected the state. So this is a rhetorical question. But when you talk about how the state is literally predicated on violence, a lot of people who are, let's say, still undoing their statist programming, mm -hmm. as I once was, as mm -hmm. you were would take issue with that. Why and how is the state predicated entirely on violence? So I like to come to the issue of taxation for this because a lot of people say, well, tax taxation is voluntary. This is your duty. You have to do it. But if I don't consent, if I don't want to do it, if I just say, no, thank you, not for me, like I'm not hurting anyone. I'm just, I mean, I'm sure people would say, yes, you are because you're not paying, but like I'm not initiating violence against mm -hmm. anyone and keeping to myself. But if I were to not pay it and the government were to find that out and take issue with it, I'm not saying they would pursue me, but they could if they wanted to. Right. And Or if you don't go through the exact processes through common law to do exactly. it in a specific way. Exactly. Right? Like in a right. mainstream sense, well, what happens? They send right. you a notice and they threaten you. Right. And they either threat to they threaten to steal from you. And if that keeps going and you don't give them your property, well, then what happens? Then they assert the right to hurt you, to come to your home. Someone, a government agent will come to your home. And if you resist, what happens? Mm -hmm. And a common retort to that is like, well, you had it coming. But what did I do? Mm -hmm. All I did was I didn't comply with your rules. And the fact that like every policy is, is predicated on that. You look at someone like Eric Garner, who was murdered by cops. It was like 2014. I'm not sure the exact year, but he was selling, I think, untaxed cigarettes. Right. And he was killed. And it, people will say, well, there are a lot of steps in between that. He was resisting. But why were the cops called? Because right. he broke some arbitrary rule on paper. He wasn't hurting anyone. And yet he died because of it. So it always comes down to violence. That is the biggest tool and really the most fundamental tool the state has. Yeah. Even if it's for something, quote, good, yeah. that means well. And usually the outcome of that is a lot worse off than it would be if it were voluntary. That's, I mean, that, that, that's <laughs> the thing that I oftentimes say, too, is under the guise of protecting us from mm -hmm. terrorism, mm -hmm. as an example, right? You look at Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom. And how many terrorists, like actual people who became disenfranchised and hated the land and the people on the land known mm -hmm. as the United States based on the US, U.S. government, quote, fighting for freedom and protecting us against terrorism. And also how many people were killed in the Middle East mm -hmm. in the name of trying to protect us from terrorism. 
an, a countless lives were lost to protect uh, under the under the guise of protecting us for the you know what they will say would be well you know millions of people could have died had we not killed millions of people in the right. Middle East and it's just absurd. Well, and I think it comes down to that collectivism and this really effective propaganda tool of we are the government. Mm. The government is us. This is our democracy. Our vote, our vote, our voice. That's like I think like the ABC election tag. Every election, your vote, your voice. Mm. That's not my voice. Like you can't speak through a state institution. But when you come down to that collectivism of like, like you hear people talk, it's so common. It'll be like, well, we fought the American Revolution. We did this. We passed a law. We went to war. <laughs> no, we didn't. We are sending troops over. Right. There. Exactly. Right. No, we're not. That's the government doing that. And exactly. you're also like, on the other hand, there is some culpability if you approve of these things and you support them and you pay for them. But like, we didn't drop an atomic bomb. The right. government did that. So like, no, you're actually not liable for that. To, at least to the extent of like, you didn't commit those actions. No. So this, it's such a fallacy. We are the government. And I think that started, I could be wrong, but I think that got popularized with Theodore Roosevelt, who is such a big government progressive. He's a Republican, but he ushered in a huge era of, of huge government and also imperialism. Like he was a big advocate for the Spanish American war and then sending troops abroad. And I think he presided over in a lot of ways over the occupation of the Philippines. Mm. So it's hard to separate that, like, that collectivist, we are the government, we're a force for good, force, like literally we're a force for good. Yeah. It's hard to separate that. Yeah, from... can you be a force for good? Right, can exactly. Force <laughs> someone into good? Is force itself even capable of being good? Right. The other, the other side to that too is that government as a system allows for itself to, when convenient, shift blame onto those people, assuming that voting and like legislation, et cetera, et cetera, actually is a real thing and there isn't some people behind the scenes sort of manipulating right. it to be in their favor. They'll shift blame onto individual when it fits their narrative. But then other times individuals who do bad things within government can say, oh, well, you know, I'm just doing my job. Right. Do you think that that sort of uh, approach just keeps everything, everyone from shifting, like actually taking responsibility for themselves? I think so, of course, because there's this like collective responsibility that we feel because we're raised this way. So I went to public school and what did I learn? Well, there's this democracy. We got here after horrible other forms of rule and like agree, those are all terrible forms of rule, like monarchy, not cool. Divine right of kings. I don't think so. I don't I don't think that there were individuals who were ordained by God to rule over us with violence, but it's sort of framed. And it, I think the people teaching this believe it. Like, I don't think they all think they're brainwashing us. I'm sure there are people out there like that, but there's this collective belief of like, well, democracy is where it's at or even a republic. Voting is the highest realization of the individual. But of course, that's not true. And I've heard you talk about this. of like you can a simple majority, 51 to 49. That's not representation. And a lot of people in the freedom space are saying we need to fight for our democracy. And then right. I, I want you to touch on that. And then we'll get to the, well, we're a constitutional republic right, and why that's right. also a problem, too. But yeah. touch on why democracy itself is inherently wrong. Uh, well, it comes back to <laughs> it comes back to that topic of violence. Right. Like, I don't think that you can have a peaceful I don't love the word society. Like, I think that it's a, it's a charged word. Like, what is society? But right. often it's conflated with this democracy, with government. And it's, you can't have a peaceful society when it's top-down violence. And that, like, that is the nature of the system. Even Like, it's it, this is not, like, an opinion. This is true. Like, there is a belief in this society that there are certain people who have a moral right to inflict violence. Those are the law enforcers at any level. It's not just the police. It's, like, any law enforcement wing, the FBI, the military. Right. And they get this special exemption and they're not, they're not better than any of us. They're mortal human beings. I know you've talked about this too. They're I, I men think, and women just right, like us. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, this is, I'm borrowing this from, I heard it from Larkin Rose, but it's idea of like, do you have the right to kill, to kill or steal? No. Okay. What about two people? Like if they, if they join a group, do they have the right? No. Okay. Do you have the right? Do you, can you delegate a right that you don't have to somebody else, to another person who doesn't have that right? Like this is all just ritual and like, like magical thinking, like mm -hmm. there is no special process, but it's put up on this pedestal of like, it's this like supernatural power, like, well, authority. And uh, this is something else from Larkin Rose. It's like, if you ask a police officer, like, well, why did you beat that person? It's like, well, it wasn't me. It's the law. Right. Authority this, this is made my me point, right? It. Like it, yeah. it, it, it absolves the individual mm -hmm. exactly. of responsibility for their actions when they are acting on behalf of quote government. Right. And 
for the men and women who are not within positions in government. Mm -hmm. It also absolves them of responsibility for their own lives because they can turn to government for all of their problems. Mm -hmm. It is just perpetually absolving everyone of their individual responsibility for their own shit. Right. And well, and then the politicians, what's the will of the people? Like you hear a lot in the news, like, well, a majority of Americans want this. Okay, what about the rest of them? Right. Like, how much of a majority is this? And I love to come back to Lysander Spooner for this, who is a 19th century abolitionist, but like to the fullest extent. So he was an anarchist. He didn't yeah. believe in government. And he talks a lot in No Treason about like the people who wrote the Constitution. It was a very small group of people. Even if, like, let's assume they were well-intended and mm-hmm. like they had the, they wanted, they wanted everybody to be free and they Trying thought. Trying to create limited government. Right, right exactly. Right. They thought they were doing the right thing. But did they go around and ask every person living mm-hmm. at that time if they wanted to participate? No, it was a tiny little fraction of people back then who wanted the system, who consented to the system. Mm-hmm. And then you fast forward a couple hundred years, like no one consented. And people will say, well, you consented when you were born. But that, to me, that's absolute nonsense. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. Like if you, if you don't like it, you can leave. It's like, why should I leave? I didn't. I didn't do anything. I didn't ask for this system. I was just told top down that this is that they own me. Basically, mm-hmm. they have some claim to my life and the fruits of my labor. Right. But I never consented. Right. And that's where it gets tough, because as I'm exploring stuff like related to common law, I, I understand. I don't want to say there are arguments on both sides. I tend <laughs> to agree with you in that even if the birth certificate is what I've come to learn that it is. I didn't sign that shit. Right. Like I didn't sign any of those things. And if I did sign governments with the, uh, or contracts with the government in any way, there was no intent to contract on my behalf. I didn't know that I was contracting with the government. So we have to do this whole mess of, because the collective has agreed that these adhesion contracts Mm -hmm. are legitimate. And we, you know, sometimes have to go about revoking those contracts with the government if we truly want to operate in this society. And I agree with what you said on society. All these words, it's like yeah. so hard to find right. words to actually use. <laughs> but um, it, it sucks because I completely agree. I didn't have any contract that I signed with it. Maybe I did because I was in the army, but you know what I'm saying. But so you're talking about the constitution now and a lot of people, when you say, okay, well, we're not actually a democracy. We're a constitution republic. First thing I want to say related to that is if you look into the way the U.S. federal government was set up as it currently operates within the context of common law versus the statutory legal system, it actually is a government. It is a democracy in the current way it's operating. But even if it were a constitutional republic, why is that also wrong? It still comes back to me for like, it's still force. Right. It's we can have all of our little flavors of authoritarianism. And to me, all government is authoritarianism because it's about authority. Mm-hmm. Like and sure, like there are extremes on the spectrum and there are some that are more limited and some that are more extreme and more invasive. But it's still violence. And you look at it and it's like, well, OK, and you had a Republican. What is it now? What did it devolve into? Like there's all this love for the Constitution. And I wanted to be a constitutional lawyer when I was in college. Like wow. I love the Constitution. I thought that I was studying constitutional history. I was very passionate about it because I think it enshrined some important values. Like freedom of speech, yeah, it was pretty important. Like limited government, cool. But like, did it work? That's the test of it. Did it work? No. So even if it started as a republic, the way the government was structured, it still devolved into this democracy. And to me, it's all the same thing. It's still authority versus freedom and self-ownership, but it devolved right into what you didn't want it to. So to me, that this is a Sanders Spooner again, but it failed. Right. Well, in a lot of people that are self-professed Republicans or conservatives will point to communism and the countless examples of which I don't disagree mm-hmm. throughout history of uh, governments or people or places trying to implement communism. And then it royally failed and millions mm-hmm. and millions of people died. But in a lot of those cases, the precursor to that was a democratically elected republic mm-hmm. with a bill of rights. Yeah, That's what Larkin Rose pointed to, like this mm-hmm. uh, Soviet republic, the... Uh, Red China was also mm-hmm. a democratic republic. Right. Uh, North Korea, there are countless examples. The Weimar Republic, which ended up being Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. These are all the exact same thing. So you could really say the same thing for the way our government was set up. You could mm-hmm. point to it and say, no, in any time this has been implemented throughout history, this has also failed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anything else needs to be said. <laughs> okay. So you had a tweet this I, this tweet captures it perfectly, and I just want to see if you had anything to expand upon with this. People upset that criminals run the government fail to realize that government itself is a criminal organization and so attracts criminals. 
The difference between government and organized crime is the collective belief that government deserves a moral exemption for its threats and violence. So I know you've already touched on a little bit how government is predicated on force, but there is, especially in, in 2024, a lot of people in the freedom space right now who would agree with that and at the same time think that one of the primary solutions is to try to get someone better in office. Why is that flawed thinking? Well, first, just like point to history, right? Like that has been the mentality this entire time. Like, I don't think 20 years ago, 40 years ago, people thought that they thought that they were doing the best they could. They were looking at the candidates and saying, well, this is the best option we have. But what does that produce? And it, I think like central to this is there's no real accountability. Like you have government keeping government in check, keeping government in check. You have all these like special little departments and agencies, but like they're all government. They all get their funding from the same place. They all appeal to the same authority. So to me, that's an illusion. And again, it's like, I think it's a J.R. Tolkien quote where he's talking about like, he's like, I lean more and more toward anarchism because no one like, okay, I'm, I'm not even going to try to quote it, but basically the sentiment is like, no one who wants that power should have that power, mm. should be trusted with that power. Like, I don't trust anyone whose ego is big enough to think that they can save the country. Totally. That they know what's right for how many hundreds of millions of people. To me, that's someone who has blinders on, even if they have the best of intentions. And I, and it's not like they could be a really good person. They really mean well. But to me, they're, they're shielded by this, what I would call indoctrination about mm. the power of government and the morality of government. And it's, it's also not their fault. It's kind of like Plato's The Cave. It's like, if you don't know anything else, is, if this is all you've ever been shown, of course you're going to go that route. Especially like take someone like RFK. Right, like, exactly. we, we don't have to beat it around the bush here. Right. Like a lot of people in the freedom mm -hmm. community are considering, even voluntary said, I know, are like, yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm an anarcho-capitalist, but hey man, like this is the best chance that we have. Right. We should probably get RFK in there. And I actually understand and appreciate mm -hmm. where they're coming from because it's like, look, if he can get in there and maybe take down the CDC, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah, things like this. And at the same time, there are countless things that I disagree with about RFK. And maybe, you know, that's not the most important thing to me, but there are other people mm -hmm. who the things that they disagree with that are some of my friends, that is the most important thing to them. Like maybe some of my friends that are U.S. Palestinians mm -hmm. who are like, how could you possibly vote for RFK right. and want him to get in office, given that he's already essentially said he's going to continue funding Israel to do what it's doing to my family members? Mm -hmm. Like, I cannot morally accept that. And that's where I think it's the slippery slope of like, oh, but these major things I agree with him on. And it's just a few minor things that I don't agree with him on, but that's you. Exactly. What about the other right. people around right. you who you're, you're saying, ah, but I'm sorry, what I agree with mm -hmm. should be violently imposed upon you and you should be extorted for your money to continue to fund killing of your family members in Palestine. That's wrong. It's completely wrong. And it, I think like this gets to the root of why statism doesn't work. And it does come back to the violence, but it also comes down to like, these are hundreds of millions of people. You cannot possibly account for everyone's preferences. Right. And to, to pretend, it's not pretending people believe it, but to think that however, how many hundreds of people are in Congress, like a few oh hundred, 400, even and even you add I should to, know that because right? I went to West Point and I just like threw all of that right. out of my head. I'm trying to forget. I don't want to know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, like when you learn something and you brain dump it afterwards. Yeah, that's right. But it's like the, to think that that tiny little fraction of people could possibly meet all of the needs of so many unique hundreds of millions of people. It's just, it's, it's irrational. It's utopian. And people love to tell us like, this is utopian thinking. <laughs> but, like, I think this is ut utopian to take this institution that for thousands of years has been like the biggest mass murderer, the biggest violator of people's rights, consistently failed to meet people's needs, even when it claims that that's what they're doing. Like still, the, we still, this is still the best bet we have. And I also like I've I've evolved a lot since I started doing this. It's been a very long time. And I like I was very black and white before and I'm yeah. still black and white on my morals. But like it doesn't feel good for me to just be like constantly mad at everyone totally. and like judging everyone. You know, like I completely and there's disagree. a lot of voluntarists like yeah. that, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's what, something I wanted to get to. Yeah. later <laughs> as well. Yeah. I know. I know that's been top of mind for you. So right. I was kind of like yeah. leading up to that because it's it's something that's kind of top of mind for me. But touching touching back on RFK and, and Trump, a lot of people in the freedom space are buying into what I think is a false dilemma where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, we either have to vote for RFK or we have to vote for Trump. And this is my hot take. This is my <laughs> hot take, right? I want to hear what you have to say about this. So I think 
this this is based on a presupposition, and I'm making that clear up front that our our quote votes don't actually matter in the first place, and further, they're a consent to be governed, and that's right. literally true if you look at the nature of how this government was set up. But point being, um, I think that Biden will be ruled unfit to actually be in office, so they'll usher in either Gavin Newsom, Michelle Obama, or maybe Hillary Clinton to take his place, right? And then the left will obviously go nuts and be like, oh yeah, this is absolutely someone we can get behind, right? right. And then whoever the, the left candidate is, is who will be selected, right? And then the Trump supporters will blame RFK supporters right. for taking votes from Trump. Of course. And RFK supporters will blame Trump supporters from taking votes for RFK. And it'll be a perfect way to divide the freedom community. Of course. Yeah. That sounds like exactly what's going to happen. And it's and even if that even even if that exact scenario doesn't play out, it's still the same fundamental theme. It's like we're vying for power because we think we know better. And I think that creates so much polarization because people are it's like this divide and conquer of like, well, it's the Trump supporters that are my problem or it's these Biden idiots that are my problem. It's the government. And you look at the history of this country and really anywhere. And it's just pendulum swing. So you go from right to left, from right to left. The right gets into power. The left gets mobilized. They get a left person off as the right gets mobilized and they view each other as these threats when, in fact, again, it's like it's not it's not your neighbor who disagrees with you politically who's the real threat. It's these people who are in power, who we believe I'm, I'm not part of that. We but like I was for a very long time. So who we collectively believe have this right to rule. Mm -hmm. And it's like I remember it was like the, the peaceful transfer of power. Like, what does that even mean based on what? Well, it's not peaceful at all because it's government. Like mm -hmm. it's I've, I've, I've said enough about government being violence. Like it's it's inherently coercive. But like so that other people can rule over other people. It, it's again, it's like all based on this imaginary thinking that some people have a right to rule. Mm -hmm. Your rituals, like you put your hand on a Bible and you say some words and like you swear to uphold the constitution and then like, poof, you have, you can control people. Right. And I like, that is like, that's why I'm like, okay, fine. If you want to vote, I think it's immoral. I think you're wrong. I think it's ineffective. I think it's the worst possible way to make a change or quote, save the country. If it makes you feel better, okay, but like you have to start thinking in a different way. Yeah. If you want to do that, cool, but I really hope you evolve past that into seeing the system as a whole and how it functions because it hasn't worked. Like, and this is not my sentiment, but it's it's very common among people of, of our, our, I don't even want to say group, but people who share our beliefs. Like this was supposed to be like the most limited government on earth. It was revolutionary. It inspired revolutions around the world for advocating limited government for freedom. And it devolved into this. Like, at what do you think that it's still salvageable? I don't. I don't think it ever was. And that's the sentiment. Well, you just didn't do it right. Right. Exactly. But it's like, <laughs> which even, is what it always is. <laughs> just do it. We, we just, just have to try to it right. with my people in power. If exactly. we get the people I think are fit to rule exactly. power, it'll be fine. But exactly. you look at the history and it's like, as soon as the government was created, the quote founding fathers, which would be such a creepy term, but like yeah, they is. were violating it. Like there was this, I, I did a lot of research on the founding fathers a couple of years ago and like Thomas Jefferson, like reading his memos and private letters, he knew that the Louisiana purchase was probably unconstitutional. Like he was writing in his private, private letters, like, oh, I think we're going to have to get an amendment for this. And then he didn't anyway. And like, that's to me, like that's its own problem. But like you look at, I think it was John Adams and the Alien and Sedition Acts, like mm -hmm. trying to limit speech and criticism of government. You got George Washington with the Whiskey Rebellion, like putting people down, like poor farmers for not paying their taxes. And it's like, and to me, it's like, it's not to say that they were horrible people. They were hypocritical, but you also look at their childhoods. It's like, these were, these were just people mm -hmm. who had difficult childhoods and probably were dealing with difficult emotions and they were trying their best, but like, no one's perfect. No one's immortal. And that's why I have an issue with calling them like founding fathers. Like they're right. not my fathers. This is just, I have nothing to, I don't I know these people. I didn't claim them as right? founding fathers. Right? Right? Exactly. Yeah. But like, sure. Maybe it, like at the very best, they were trying their best and they were flawed and they were human. And that is the fundamental problem with power. Oh. Yeah. That's why I uh, tend to side. I don't. I don't want to say take sides, with, but really appreciate what the anti-federalists had to say mm -hmm. back in that time. But um, you know, people are waking up to the the problems with government, and I think COVID really amplified that mm -hmm. over the last four years. And I, I don't. There's no implications here in what I'm about to say surrounding what RFK is or is not, or a libertarian candidate. I mean, I just interviewed Michael Rechtenwald the other day, who I appreciate, by the way, because he basically said, yeah, I'm running for president to use the platform to show how the state is fundamentally corrupt. I'm right. like, dude, I appreciate yeah. that. I that. <laughs> but um, 
the the thing that that is that is frustrating is that as people are starting to wake up to the problems with government, then another can, uh, candidate comes in who I think people are now latching onto and latching back on to hope that they can save the system from the inside. Do you think there's any viability in that? And that's, again, assuming that votes even matter and assuming that it's not, you know, you consenting to slavery, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think at a local level, it, there might be some merit to that. You know, like if you can vote in a prosecutor who's going to be less harsh on victimless crimes, okay. Like I'm probably not going to participate, but I'm not going to knock you for that. Yeah. I understand. And I think that like, do you know Renette Sinem? Mm-mm. Are you familiar with her? Mm-mm. She was the mayor of Nevada City in California, and she is a voluntarist. She is, uh, she's very well versed in common law, and she was running for governor. And I was like, that is the one exception, maybe, that I would mm-hmm. ever consider voting for someone yeah. because I know that she would use that position to say, look, everyone, I have right. no authority, exactly. and I'm going to do everything that I can to give you all of your authority back. Mm-hmm. But when have you heard a candidate actually say something like that? Right. And like, that's the thing, too, is, and I'm outside of, like, I believe her intentions, and I believe that, like, I think there are people who would be, like, uncorruptible. Mm-hmm. But I think, like, especially at a federal level, at a state right. level, you can get into it for the right reasons. But either you're going to be like Ron Paul, who like his great power of being in Congress was that he spread the message. It wasn't that he was actually like blocking government action because you can't. That's just there's too much power and too much like lust for power there. People aren't going to let go of that. And there's too many people there who believe so, so wholeheartedly that either they have the answers, they know best, but also or not either, but that they have the answers and know best. And that they have the right to do that. Like it comes back to this idea of like a right to rule, mm-hmm. a right to make decisions for other people. And it's very difficult to stay true to your principles in that kind of environment when when you become like addicted to that power. And it's really like an ego thing. It's like I think like AOC years ago, even years ago, like shortly after she took office, I saw some tweet from her and she said something about like how she had. I don't think she used the word power, but basically like she has power. And if you're not in Congress, you're shouting from the cheap seats. Wow. Like it's like. <laughs> And I, I don't know the direct quote of that, but it's like, and she was supposed to be like a people's candidate. And of course I disagree with her entire platform and philosophy, but yeah. like to some extent, maybe there was some authenticity there to start, but now she's in a position where she has to pander to keep her position. And then she has to sacrifice her principles. So you lose both. Right. You're no longer authentic and you, you don't stand for anything. Why, why do you think voting third party or just libertarianism let's let's say libertarian first especially because you were ron paul supporter i know Mm -hmm. he ran as a republican but let's be real that dude is a libertarian if not a voluntarist but why why do you think like libertarianism gets it wrong still well i think if you look at the fundamental principles of libertarianism the logical conclusion is a stateless society like if you oppose the use of force how can you support the use of force for like certain services that you deem the most essential and this is not my original thought but it's like a very common sentiment of among the anarchists and the voluntarists like it's you're still using government and if you are a libertarian you probably have a good sense of like well power corrupts and the government is always going to grow and like i again i think these people are well intended i certainly like they're more principled and have a better idea of diagnosing the problems than like republicans and democrats but I think, too, another reason that it's problematic is that it just funnels, funnels people back into the system right. and it keeps their thinking so limited as opposed to like, well, what could I do in my individual life, in my community? You're just like delegating your agency to somebody else to do it for you. And right. I, and I th- not to interrupt no, real no, no, quick, no, but ahead. I think that like the, the other thing with libertarianism is it's this idea that we have to focus so much effort to do things within the confines of the system the way that it is mm-hmm. that if you're still operating within that construct can then be overturned by another candidate who comes back right. in a few years later. Exactly. Like more policies that are implemented the other way to go back the other way. And it's like, damn, that un- that just undid all of the work that we just did. Exactly. And you that's just, assuming that it's even possible or it even Exactly. Works. That you can like ram it through and like looking at the way Congress is constructed. Unlikely. Like unless there's like a huge revolution in thought. Which my hope is that if that happens, it's toward it's like beyond libertarian party stuff. It's into like actual freedom, like true self ownership, not like let me delegate my agency to somebody else to fix it for me. Because I like, and a lot of it's like we've been conditioned to think that we can't, mm. that like these people have this magical knowledge that we don't possess. They have the ability, they have the resources, they can do it, but they only do because we believe they can. One hundred percent. It's all predicated on our belief. And the the thing that 
I mean, I've I've been going pretty hard about on the topic of voting lately on social media. I love as it. <laughs> you've and a lot of people have said to me, and I I try to be very careful about how I communicate things that I'm coming across as very pessimistic, that I'm blackpilling, that I'm giving up, <laughs> and things like this. Why can can you articulate why that's completely incorrect? And you know, speaking for us as volunteers, we are not black pilling or or right. pessimistic about any of this stuff i have so many thoughts on this because yeah. i've been getting this for years i make my videos about i never say the word anarchy but like that's what i'm articulating and right. invariably no matter the video even if it's a video on like solutions i get a comment of like well what's your solution all you're doing is complaining you just want to complain and i have I've, there are several layers of my counter to this which is first like i think it's a reflection of how deep the indoctrination is that if you don't vote you're doing nothing it's like this belief that your only agents, the only thing you could possibly do is to like check a box for somebody to do it for you. That's doing something, especially in the context of like, well, again, how effective has that been? Has that led to less government? No, not from either party. So there's that. But then there's also, I strongly believe that what you're doing, what I, I like to think I'm doing in my videos is you're changing the level of consciousness. Right. And there's a great talk by Larkin Rose. I'm a big Larkin Rose fan. Um, it's called So Small a Thing, I think, at Anarchapulco 2016. And he talks about, like, you don't have to, like, fight the cops. You don't have to go wage war against the government. That's not going to be the most effective way because what this is, it's a mindset. It's a belief system. So as much as somebody can call it complaining, to me, this is one of the most core solutions we could possibly pursue is to change the way people think about government. Because people love to go on about like propaganda and indoctrination and in the public schools. And like, yes, that's all there. It's it's certainly it, there's flavors of it. But the ultimate indoctrination to me is this belief in the state's legitimacy. Right. This is just what we were taught. It's what I was taught. It's what I believed without question for really no reason at all. It's just what I was told. And when it's like an authority adult figure telling you that that's true, why would you question it? But that's why it's so important to question it and why that in itself to me is a solution. Right. Like change change thought because as soon as people's belief in the legitimacy falls away their power crumbles like they are resting so much on our just assumption that they have authority but to question the authority itself i think is so fundamental to any change because we can have like the technological advances that the disrupting solutions and those are so important like i don't want to diminish those at all but if we still have the mindset of statism we're going to keep having statism like the the material solutions really don't matter Dr. Tom Cowan, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He, I, what I appreciate about him so much is just the way that he thinks. And he says something to the effect of the best way to discover what is true is to peel back all of the bad arguments and all of the things that are verifiably not true. Mm -hmm. And then you are left with something that has to represent something that is as close to truth as possible, right? And I think people like you, me, Lark and Rose, what we're doing is we're ripping up all of the arguments for the state and the necessity of the state and we're pointing people towards something where they have to form their own solution because it's mm -hmm. also i think a major problem that people are even coming to us thinking that we are required to give them a solution right? <laughs> and i completely agree with you too that the mindset shift itself is the solution because you think that you know thoughts and feelings lead us to actions or inaction, and I would say beliefs as well, that create our reality. So shifting the paradigm of beliefs, thoughts, and feelings mm -hmm. is what leads to actions that are predicated on the individual doing mm -hmm. the work. And that's the other thing about voluntarism. When people are turning to people like me and you and looking for solutions, that actually flies in the face of what we're preaching essentially because right. it's all about developing your own individual right. solution and getting out of a collective mindset right. that's the whole point completely and i think a big impediment to that that i think we haven't gotten into yet is really the emotional aspect yeah because we live in such a fear-based climate and it's very much like it's this idea at least what i observe in the modern political climate and i think really always is people have feelings that don't feel very good they're afraid of something they're angry about something and they just want it to go away like, I don't want to feel afraid. I don't want to feel this discomfort. I don't like this. Please, somebody make it go away. And then these politicians step in and they're like, I can solve this for you. Don't worry about it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. I'll handle it for you. And it like it's very easy to get caught in that trap, even if they're saying things, you know, like RFK says some good things. And I don't think he's intentionally like he's I, I, I don't know. I don't know enough to comment on him. But like 
I, I'm not, I don't think he's like I think he in, grew up in a political environment right, and that's exactly, what he knows. That's what he knows. That's what he knows. And that's what it comes down to is like, what do we know? We know that the system works. Mm -hmm. We know that it's the most superior. It's the peak of civilization. We evolved to democracy and representative government. And that's how we solve problems. And we also know that like, well, I don't like feeling this discomfort. I don't want to feel afraid. Like after 9-11, everyone was terrified. And so they wanted the government to do something. And you lose your agency that way. You lose your sense, even like your sense of self-worth, even if you're not conscious of it, this idea of like, I can't solve my own problems. And I know that there are like big problems in the world. Obviously, and one individual can't necessarily solve them all. But with all of the billions of people on this planet, like unique individuals with unique skills and gifts and perspectives, like it's hard to believe that people couldn't solve problems without government. Right. I completely <laughs> agree. And then you you look at issues like the the border, let's say, and like I said this the other day, I don't doubt that there is some sketchy people coming across the southern border, right? <laughs> but I would say largely the issue was initially created mm -hmm. by government itself, the U.S. government waging war mm -hmm. against people in foreign countries mm -hmm. that then lead to displaced peoples who are then coming over. And it's like the left hand, right hand thing, mm -hmm. the right maybe more so neocons, which does, you know, bring in some of the left. Obama dropped a lot of bombs. Yeah. But the point is neocons and the right historically have been the authoritarian one that, quote, fights for freedom ab mm -hmm. abroad, dropping bombs over there. And then the left opens up the border for all those people right. who hate the government. And then also because this, this statist ideology has plagued the entire world at this point, conflate us as right. men and women who are just living here right. with the government. So mm -hmm. then they hate us by virtue of that. And they're coming over through the border. Mm -hmm. But what, even, even so, right. I think that if there are sketchy people and I, I believe there are coming across the border, ultimately the problem is not going to be solved by more government and whatever quote <laughs> solution the government offers because of that issue is going to make the problem worse and is going to infringe upon more of our rights. Mm -hmm. It's going to give the government more authority. So it's kind of like this, I struggle with the perspective of like, well, we need more government to solve this problem. Well, what does that mean? That means more police. That means more control over your private information, probably mm -hmm. like more patrols, more everything like biometrics, all of these things that will be ushered in. And it's like, again, with government, you might be cool if your party, if your team does it. But what happens when the other team gets into power? You're not going to like it very much like Obama with his kill list. Liberals are whole. First of all, most liberals didn't even know about it. But like if they did, it was like, well, but he's not going to abuse it. He said he wasn't going to abuse it. Same with the NDAA with the uh, indefinite detention clause, right. which I'm pretty sure is still in the NDAA every year. Yeah. It's not in the text, but because it was passed, I think, in like 2012. I don't think it was ever repealed. No, I think there have been some attempts, but I'm pretty sure it's still in there. Mm. Like those kinds of things. Well, you can rationalize that when your guy has the power. But what about when the guy you don't trust has it? Yeah. And it's like that back, that pendulum swing back and forth. And in the end, the government always wins. Do you have any friends who are volunteerists who've decided that they're going to vote for RFK? No. You don't have any? Okay. <laughs> I don't. It sounds like you do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I just, that, that just bothers me based on principle. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, again, there are countless things that I personally disagree with RFK on, but let's assume that I agreed with him on every single mm -hmm. thing. Just the... Again, going back to the Palestinian example, mm -hmm. putting someone in office that is going to use a mechanism that is government to wield authority over everyone else violently just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't right. seem morally justifiable. And it, I just, I don't know, I just look at it as a big trick, whether unintentional or not, to get people to be conditioned mm -hmm. in the statism ideology again, because so many people are starting to wake up to the problems mm -hmm. with government itself. I had a friend who's a huge RFK supporter, messaged me today and say, what have you earned by not voting that I don't have by me continuing to vote? And I have a lot of thoughts on that. And I, I think, you know, I have a lot of friends who've done a lot of, let's say, common law processes to um, I, I want to speak to this carefully a little bit that had have verifiable proof that some of those processes work and you actually can obtain more freedom and become more financially abundant through doing said processes. But even setting that aside, I think it's a complete mindset shift in that I don't believe that any men or women inside government 
or outside of government have any right to tell me what to do. And I have no obligation to comply with them. Mm -hmm. And I set my own moral standards. And I think if everyone took on that approach, that would bring about collective freedom in a way that we could never dream of by voting. And, And that's assuming that voting even works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think on that note, like to add on to that, I think something you get out of that is you're not jerked around by the news cycle and the politics of it. Because when you're hooked into that and you're, you have like high stakes attached to that, it's not a fun way to live. Right. There's a lot of reactivity. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of just like bracing for horrible things to happen. When you don't believe in that legitimacy and you see the system for what it is, like, Okay, I don't have to worry about that every day because it doesn't matter to me who has power. The system itself is illegitimate. Qualifying statement on that, though, that's coming up for me. And I think (laughs) you'd agree with this because this is what you've been talking about lately. And I think it's a perfect segue. There is a lot of Mm voluntarists, a lot of anti-state people who are glued to the news cycle Mm -hmm. and glued to what they are doing, perpetually pointing the finger. Yeah. And I went through that phase. Mm -hmm. I know you've talked about how you Mm -hmm. went through that phase, too. But I think it's it's really important that we evolve past that as well, because if we're truly going to be free, mm-hmm. we need to be free in our nervous system, as mm-hmm. you're saying. So I'd love for you to just brain dump on where you're <laughs> at with this. OK, yeah, absolutely. So first, if you're angry, if you are like rageful, that's valid. I don't like the point here is not to say, like, well, you shouldn't feel that way because it, that's a healthy reaction to to what we see every single day, the nature of the system, the specifics of how the system manifests itself, like the the healthy reactions to be like, absolutely not. And to feel something about it. But I think the problem that I experienced was getting hooked into that. And I used to run a news organization, like the anti-media, like we had a big following before we were So you literally had to be hooked. Yeah. Yeah. Every single day I was like every day, watch scrolling Reddit for the news, like seeing what horrible thing happened today. Who's suffering? Who was murdered? Who was bombed? Like, How many children died in this bombing overseas? Like, and it's, it's, there's a point in time where I think it is important to know those things because you have to be shaken out of of the indoctrination and the haze. And you have to know what leads to that. Exactly. Exactly. It's important to know, but it gets to a point where it's detrimental to your well being Mm. to stay hooked into that because there is, it's like a biological response. It's not just in, I mean, it is in your head because your brain is reacting, but you're caught in like constant fight or flight. There's this reactivity to it. And for me, that was not, I didn't want to live that way. It doesn't feel good. It feels good at first. You're like, you know better. I know better. And these people are stupid and I have the answers. Like, okay. But even that starts to feel like it, it has the same for me, like the same somatic feeling as being angry at the state. Like, right. even though it like, yes, I'm right. But like, what is it like a gripping in my chest? Like my heart's beating faster. Like there's this like agitation to it. And for me, maybe this isn't true for everyone, but for me, I'm not free when I'm caught. And like to bring it back to the state, like, then you're still a slave to the state. Right. If your emotional well-being and your emotional state depends on the government and what the government is doing, how are you free? Because for me, like freedom is no longer just about freedom from the politics. It's like a spiritual freedom in my own being, like how I relate to the world and the universe and people and myself, like and in my day to day life. Like it's so far beyond just the government that for me, like I, I can't live that way to be constantly gripped and constant. Like I'm, I'm just enslaved to outside forces and myself, like my own body having this reaction. And adding to that, cause I, I'm just sitting over here nodding my head. I'm <laughs> off camera and I'm just like this, like, yes, I completely agree. But, um, adding to that, as I've come to learn, uh, the, the true nature of the law. And again, this is still playing within the confines of the way things are, but I would say common law is the law that is synonymous with voluntarism because as long as you don't harm someone, mm-hmm. kill someone, defraud someone or their proper, you know, harm their property, then you are obeying the law. It goes mm-hmm. right in with natural law. It goes right in with mm-hmm. voluntarism. It goes right in with the, um, with the non-aggression principle. Mm-hmm. Right. But as I've been learning that I've also been learning about, again, what are a lot of adhesion contracts that we are in with the state. But ultimately, as, I, as I'm learning that as you revoke those contracts, both by expressing them verbally, uh, expressing them as we were talking about before in a sort of esoteric metaphysical way, overwhelmingly, the case is that they they do what they do to us by virtue of our own consent Mm -hmm. or lack of knowledge or lack of self-respect or lack Mm -hmm. of self-ownership. 
So that kind of goes hand in hand with being emotionally pulled around by them, because I think there's a lot of sentiments in the voluntarist anarchist community of continually just pointing the finger, looking at Mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think that that can often be used as a crutch to not do your own inner work. Like I've been to events and like they're wonderful events, but I've heard people specifically say, well, I'd be happy if it weren't for the government. Like, well, certainly that's not helping, but like that's such like. To me, that's like a denial of your own like richness as a human being. Like you've had your own life experience. Like there, you've had experiences completely independent of the state that have affected you and shaped you and caused difficulties and trauma and also like made you unique and brought you so many special skills. Not that like trauma, that's not what I'm trying to say. Like that, but ultimately no, you, like- No, you're spot on. I get what you yeah, mean. I think like, the audience will too. There's so much more dimension to it than just like the government is bad, so I'm miserable. But I will say there's one exception to that, which is that I think a lot of this belief in authority is intergenerational. Like it's mm. passed down from parent to child to parent to child. Like whether it's just it's like, do what I say. Well, because I said so. Like that's a perfect mirror for the government. Like if yes. when children are raised in that way, they're going to be so much more submissive when they hear it from somebody else. And like, of course, there are families that hit their children. I know that's a very hot topic. But like, what are you modeling for your child? Like submission and use of force. Right. So I think that in it, that that's a way that statism is passed down through the family. But there's also, we all have issues we got to work through that really have nothing to do with government. Yeah. And it, again, like being able, like government is a distraction in that way. Because for me, like my freedom, again, it's not limited to freedom from government. Mm -hmm. For me, a lot of my freedom has come from doing my own inner exploration and healing. And that has really affected how I view government too. Like I feel, I just feel more calm now. Like I don't, and yes, it helps that like, I don't believe in any of this. Like it's all an illusion to me, but like, having to do my own inner work unrelated to the state and the problems it causes me, like that's been the biggest piece of my evolution as a free being. Right. And there's such a subtle yet major difference in the sentiments from uh, look at what they're doing, like pointing the mm-hmm. finger, like look at this big bag, bad entity that is government, yeah. right? And l- pointing to and being aware of what they're doing and being like, look, I'm... I've come to the conclusion that they have no actual authority over me and I'm living by it. I believe yeah. that. Like mm-hmm. our, if, if we're really saying that their authority is predicated on our belief, mm-hmm. then there needs to, how do I put this? Th- this subtle, there, there's like a subtle belief amongst the voluntarist community that they do have authority, right? right? You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, it's all predicated on our belief, but then mm-hmm. there are so many people that are so afraid of what the government is doing mm-hmm. and they still believe exactly. that they have authority. And I'm really trying to get to the point, and I think I'm pretty much there. It's like, no, no, no. They don't have authority and it's one big fat joke. It really is like the man behind the curtain in The mm-hmm. Wizard of Oz. And are there police officers that will infringe and impose upon you? Yes, but I think if you are aligned in mind, body, and in Mm -hmm. spirit, the amount of times that that will come into your field of awareness is very limited relative to those that are just constantly focusing on how big and bad the government is. I think they're attracting more of that stuff. Exactly. Like, it's a fixation. And I understand the fixation. Like, I've been there. And, like, to an extent, I have to talk about these current events. Like, I have to be aware of them somewhat Mm -hmm. if I want to talk about these things at all. Same. How do you balance that out? How do you balance that out? I don't know. It's... It's interesting because it's like, I just, I just have to have the little details, right? So like, if I want to make a video on war, or I want to make a video on the state, like I should have something relevant. So I fact check and I put it in there. But like, to me, it's like people, what are they fixing on? Like Ukraine, the border, COVID, like spending, Israel, Palestine. Israel, Palestine. And to me, it's like, I look at it and I'm like, hmm, corruption, violence, corruption, violence, (laughs) corruption, violence, corruption. Oh, it's all the same thing. It's been that way forever. So like, I try to actually a practical thing I do is when I'm like being really good, I meditate before I go on social media. Mm. I have to, because like, if you notice, like for me, the second I open Twitter, or I open Instagram, I feel my heart starting to like, same. Yeah. Even same. if it's stuff I agree with, yep. like there's just this like activation totally. and like, there's a time and a place for that. But like biologically, that's not what that response is for. Like it's so overused. And then, and I think too, like, I don't know if I'm diverging from the question, but no, like, it doesn't matter if you do. Right? I do that literally all the time in the right. middle of questions sometimes. Yeah, so right. that's good. <laughs> well, I think like that's 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 it. Like when you're constantly agitated, I feel like it, it like snowballs. Like there's a snowball effect where like if you're agitated for being on social media, you're gonna see the next news story and you're gonna be even more angry. Then you're gonna go back on social media, and you're gonna argue with people, and you're like, like something I had to learn to do very early on was like pause before I commented 
on yeah. somebody's post or like because I would get really mean comments on my post. I still do. I just don't read the comments anymore. Mm -hmm. That's something else I do. Like, sorry, I didn't see it. I don't know. You <laughs> scream into the void. I won't know. I've been <laughs> I've been replying to comments less and less and yeah. less. And and the thing is like you said this in a lecture that you gave at the Greater Reset, which was incredible, by the Thank way, you. as are all of your videos. Um, but just just noticing it mm -hmm. as it arises, mm -hmm. noticing these feelings as they arise. And I think just giving attention to mm -hmm. them and calling them for what they are really takes the weight off of them. And I've said this quite a bit with my, uh, I, I did a 15 day water fast and I'm laughing because it's like a running <laughs> joke how many times I bring it up. But it was so <laughs> profound for me yeah. because there was no ability for me to cope with anything else. Mm -hmm. As emotions came, I had to right. just be with them and yeah. that's it. Just feel them and then they're gone. And I think that because we're bombarded with information more than we ever have been mm -hmm. in, in modern history, we don't stop and pause to be like, wait, how is this making me feel right. in my body? How is reading this headline? How is seeing this comment? How is seeing this person say this or seeing these two people debate? How does that make me feel? And just paying attention to it. Right. And then like the next step of that is like, well, how can I be kind to myself? is the kind thing to do to maybe like step off social media right now, like take a break. And it's really like, it doesn't have to be that. It's just like, it can be something as simple as like, ooh, like this is really stressful right now. I'm noticing that like, I'm really activated about this. But just bringing that awareness to it, it takes away the unconscious power it has over you. Because you, I look at whether it's in our community or it's like the broader status community, there's this commonality of like hyperactivation, hyperreactivity, and like no pause. No pause. You just like vomit it out into the void or into social media and it feels good for a second. But then what? Like mm -hmm. in my experience, like it ceases to feel good and it feels good for me to create. Like when I'm actually making a video, I like I feel so connected and aligned and I'm flowing and it feels so right. But like, as soon as I post it on Instagram, I'm like, I got to get off. Like, right. this is not, I can't look at it. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear like my It's like an artistic again. pursuit to you. Right. And then after that, it's like, this is no longer helpful. So I just right. need to put my art out there and then right. I, it's, it's there and I'm gone. Yeah. And like, yeah. it's also a sense of like, I have to say something. Like, that's why I started making videos. It was just a sense of like, I can't be silent. Mm -hmm. As I look on all this injustice, all this violence, all this corruption, I can't be aware of it and not say something. And I still feel that way. It's just like it's become imperative for me to then step away. I put mm -hmm. it out there, I drop it off, and then I'm out. Like, I got to go do yoga. I got to meditate. I have to take some space mm -hmm. because it is so hyperactivating. And again, like, you can believe exactly as we do, but if you're still caught in this kind of reactivity, and it's like an addiction to being angry. <gasps> like I And it's an addiction to the stress hormones you're pumping out. But this is not like, we're not just talking about like woo spiritual stuff. This is like on a biological chemical level. Yeah. It is affecting your body. And like, I don't want the government affecting my body and brain in that way. I don't need that. Like, absolutely not. Like, it's inviting that power back in. Right. And ironically, it's also creating a situation where you are communicating voluntarist principles to people in a way that is then not helpful. Because mm -hmm. if you're not in a healthy, imbalanced uh, nervous system, say, I don't like mm -hmm. saying nervous system. I just yeah. like saying our whole being just yeah. like every, all the yeah. essence of our being. If you're not in a healthy mind, body, spirit state of being, then the way you are communicating is going to reflect your internal state. And mm -hmm. that's going to cause messiness and people aren't going to receive yeah. the message as well. Yeah. And I mean, there's been countless times where I've literally done that and mm -hmm. I can see where, mm -hmm. oh man, man, I go back and look at some of the things that I've said or videos that I've made. I'm like, I did not communicate that well. And I know why I didn't communicate yeah. that well, because I was feeling a lot of messiness inside mm -hmm. of me and it actually hinders our ability to communicate messages effectively. Yeah, same. I look back at some of my old videos. I mentioned this in the talk. Like my face is like mangled like when I first started making videos because I was not in a good place. And was I right? Like, Maybe, probably. Do I stand by the words of those videos? Yeah. But like, I can see that I was suffering. Mm. And the sad thing too, is that like, people love that, which is a reflect, not all people, but like, there's a lot of people on the internet. They love that. Like they love just the raging and like the, because it like, I think it validates them. And again, like, it's okay to be angry for sure. But like, do you want to stay there? Mm. Because the system right now, like, it's not changing. I have hope that it is and it's evolving. And like, it's kind of inevitable. It's going to keep evolving like this decentralization, like, and People are going to keep waking up. I don't love that term, but like for lack of a better one, like people will keep waking up. Perspectives are going to keep changing. But like in the meantime, like the government's not going to be gone tomorrow. So I like I'll take care of myself on every level, like the material level, but the spiritual level and emotional level. All right. 
the it's funny you bring this up too because i've i've thought about this that um you know how people you said people love the rage inciting content and i think it's because it's 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 like that's meeting them where they're at mm-hmm. energetically too yeah and who was I, I was talking i think with my friend joel rafiti about this and he said something very similar where when i put out a post that is related to someone having to take 100 percent ownership for their own life and their own feelings and their own thoughts and emotions that is calling them to do better mm-hmm. i don't get as many likes and i don't give a shit right, about the likes right. but it's a reflection right yeah, exactly. whereas if i'm doing something that is like pointing the finger at someone else and exactly. allowing someone else to point the finger at someone else mm-hmm. i get thousands of likes and it's like wow that is really interesting because yeah. it shows the level the the sort of collective level amongst the freedom community of where people are at mm-hmm. in their understanding of how much true self ownership mm-hmm. is required in order to truly turn the tide because it really does come down to a collective of individuals making individual mm-hmm. choices to become truly free. Yeah. And it's scary. It's scary. Like I spent most of my life, like not even aware that I was afraid of feeling my feelings because I was so good at turning them away and numbing them out and like, just, Nope, that's, it doesn't look like anything to me. I don't know what that is. Like and just distraction, distraction, distraction. What's the government doing that I can be mad about? You know, and like not having to go inward, it's really, really scary. Mm. And a lot of people will like even just scoff at the idea that that's important. Like, I don't have a, I don't have feelings. Like th- those liberals are so problematic because they're so emotional. Look at how emotional those liberals are. And like, honestly, a lot of the people I see saying that are just as emotional about their own issues. But like, it's also like, to me, the problem is not emotions. That is a fundamental part of being human. The problem is like a lack of awareness about them and an inability to hold space for them because that's when they run rampant. That's when they take over and you're not pausing and you can't like you can't like what I was saying is like I learned I have to like I don't even really reply to comments anymore. But my practice was like type it out and then take a few breaths and then read it again. And inevitably, I would be like deleting a few words here and there and like mm, that doesn't need to be that sarcastic. Harry. Like that's not necessary and it's not helpful either. Right. Like and my videos are still pretty sassy, but like over the years, I feel like I've gotten a lot more mindful of like, do I have to be that? mean though like yeah. and like and it has it was, an effect that is helpful to communicate a right. message yeah and there must be a fine line in yeah. your internal process like yeah that might be a little bit too much yeah and i'm still figuring that out like i yeah. don't proclaim to like it's it's gonna be a lifelong process but how do you really, feel like, how do you feel in your body now versus how you felt back then so much better <laughs> like it was this constant <laughs> right. activation yeah right. and like that can be good fuel but again like i don't want to stay stagnant i don't want to stay caught in that reactivity because that is the exact kind of reactivity that fuels the state of some, mm-hmm. like the inability to pause, the anger, the fear, like, and that leads oftentimes to like somebody else do it for me. I can't handle it. And I think that might be, as I'm saying this, like that might have something to do with like the voluntarists who want to go vote because it is really hard. It doesn't feel good to be angry and afraid of what the government's going to do all the time. So it's like, oh, well, somebody sounds like maybe they could help. Like, okay, let me, let me have them do it. And that way I don't have to feel as much of this frustration and fear. I think another thing too, and I, I want to circle back to mm-hmm. touching on emotions as it relates to compassion. Um, but another thing too, with voluntarists or people who you know are, are aware of government corruption and are starting to become voluntarists and starting to understand the illusion of authority and then shift right back mm-hmm. is because they're fearful of the unknown. Because mm-hmm. the reality is, aside from small tribal cultures mm-hmm. across the world, of which many still exist that are truly voluntarists, by mm-hmm, the way. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from those, though, we don't know of any uh, of voluntarism working on a large scale because we haven't tried mm-hmm. it before. And I think that uncertainty and not being able to hold that uncertainty and be okay with, mm-hmm. look, I don't know what's to come, but I know that all of these things yeah. are not it brings people right back to all those things that aren't Mm -hmm. it because they just cannot hold that uncertainty. They cannot cope with the reality that I don't know what the answers are yet, but I'm going to go on an explorative, exploratory, exploratory journey. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought up uncertainty because I think that is a big driver of people's clinginess to the state and to these like prescribed mainstream solutions because they can't sit with uncertainty, which is so like, it's so silly to me because that's like a basic part of being human. It's always been uncertain. You don't, you can't have all the answers. You can't Mm. have certainty of anything. And so like you apply that to the state and like, of course people are going to vote for the person who speaks with certainty and acts like they can solve all their problems. And it's like, I don't fault them for that. I understand. I see it. It is really scary to sit with uncertainty. And I think that was a big part of COVID too. People were so terrified 
from the beginning. And they just wanted politicians to come in and be like, no, we can fix this. Follow this rule, not rule. And then you'll be OK. You'll be safe. Mm-hmm. I'll make it safe for you if you just comply with what I'm telling you. And it's certain. Yeah. And was it certain? Of course not. Like none of that was certain, but it felt a lot better to feel certain about it than to sit with the scariness of uncertainty. I think if you were to sit down a hundred people who plan on voting for RFK or Trump in the upcoming election and ask them and really get to the core, overwhelmingly, the reason they're voting would truly be based in fear. Mm-hmm. That's what it would be based in. I, I think there'd maybe be a few who are like, no, no, no. I'm not scared at all, but I just want to stick it to the establishment. Right. And I appreciate those sentiments. Yeah. Like if if you're choosing, if you're making a conscious decision to vote for RFK or Trump because you want to stick it to the establishment, but you have also dissolved the illusion of authority, which I don't know how you hold both those, but good right. for you. <laughs> good for you. I can respect that. Mm-hmm. But I guarantee you that if you sat 100 down in a room and asked them, 97, 98, 99 of them would be voting out of fear. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed. Yeah. And like, again, like fear, is it bad in itself? No, like it's not wrong to be afraid. Like there's some really scary stuff going on. But again, it's like, is it running the show in your life? Right. Is it guiding the choices you're making? Is it taking you out of alignment with yourself and your own consciousness? And I think that is often the case. Yeah. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though, is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. So as you've sort of started looking into nervous system health, and I know you mentioned that you started picking up on where I'm about to lead prior Mm -hmm. to looking into nervous system health. Mm But how has the, the importance of compassion, even for those you know, agents of the state or mm-hmm. those people at the tippy top who we perceive to be malicious and evil and have ill intent towards us and want to enslave us, et cetera, et cetera, how has compassion sort of shifted your parati- paradigm? It's been such a huge part of my evolution, which this is not how I started when I was making videos. It's sort of come in in the last maybe six, seven years. And it started with having to have compassion for myself, really. And I think a lot of people can relate to this of like the inner dialogue. Like it's like a common saying of like, would you talk to your best friend the way you talk to yourself? And most people was like, absolutely not. No. And like my inner dialogue was pretty mean. And it became a necessity of like, I just can't live like this anymore. And it was as I started cultivating compassion for myself that I was able to have it for others, including people I think are doing really horrible things Mm. because Yeah, some people I think are just like born sociopaths. I think that's a thing. I think it happens, psychopaths. But I think a lot of people in positions of power who act nefariously and hurt other people, it probably started from a place of suffering. I can point back to points in my life where I caused other people harm and I absolutely was suffering internally at those points in time. Yeah. So it's it's the same, I would imagine, again, excluding the sociopaths, of which there are some. For the majority of people who are in positions of so-called authority. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of people, I've talked about this a little bit on social media, and 
I always get the same pushback, which is I'm not going to have compassion for those people. They're threatening me. They're trying to take away my liberty. They don't deserve compassion. And from like a spiritual standpoint, like that's just like inconsistent. Like if you you if you can't have comp- compassion for people you dislike, who you distrust, who you think are bad people, like it's not really compassion. Mm-hmm. It's like selective compassion. And that's not how compassion works. But I really like to clarify with this that compassion does not mean submission. You can completely stand your ground, hold the line, not comply at all, be vocal about why you're not complying, and also understand why people are behaving in the way they are, why they believe the things they do. And I think if you really look at someone's life and history, there will be like a good reason why they believe that. And if you can have empathy for that, if you can have compassion for that, like not only does it benefit them, whether they even feel or not, like on an energetic level, like to be seen. To be understood. Again, I'm still going to rationally completely disagree with what you're saying. And I'm going to like, I'll do that for the rest of my life. Like, no way. I will not comply. That's ridiculous. That's that's gibberish. You're talking stage gibberish. No way. And maybe that's mean to say. Not gibberish. But like, <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, it that's my mindset it's, about it. I mean, they use like, like legalese and I think right? the legalese is gibberish. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But it's like, and so like how I often present it is like, okay, forget about those people then. This is for yourself. Because day to day, if you live, and we've been talking about this a lot, but if you live in this activation, like this judgment, this reactivity, like it doesn't feel good. It's like corrosive on the inside. And that was my experience. Like I just got to a point where it was like surrender. Like I can't live this way anymore. It doesn't feel good to be activated all the time. And like more recently, I've gotten into the nervous system stuff, like limbic system, which really affects the entire body. So it's like a whole body thing. But like it's on a biological level. You're constantly activated. You're in fight or flight mode. You're pumping out cortisol and adrenaline like you're that's not taking care of yourself. So even if it's like a completely if if the compassion starts with self-interest, like who cares? Let's be compassionate to yourself, be kind to yourself, because it doesn't feel good to live that way. And it can actually have like real health consequences. I think the conclusion that you'll come to when you do that, at least in my experience, Mm -hmm. I imagine you'd say the same is that, okay, I want to have compassion for self. Mm -hmm. And that means that when I'm feeling this perpetual anger towards someone else, I'm not feeling compassion for myself because I'm not feeling good inside. So maybe I need to resolve the Mm -hmm. feelings of perpetual anger towards someone else, which means that I should probably learn to have compassion for them. Right, right. And it can be something as simple as like, ooh, I see how hard this is. Like somebody sees, that's me. I see what a hard time I'm having. Not like, oh, you shouldn't feel this way. Like, this is a stupid way to feel. Suck it up. Get over it. Like, you need to be compassionate. Like, no, it's just like literally, literally just your hand on your heart. Like, ooh, this, I feel this in my heart and it hurts right now and it sucks to feel this way. Yeah. Literally, just like a statement of fact. But just that act of showing up for yourself, it's so simple, but it, over time, it does make a difference. And then it allows you to see that in other people. Because, like I was saying earlier, like, whether it's a statist or an anarchist, volunteerist, whatever you want to call it, like, we see so much of the same reactivity because we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. Like, we all have these feelings and these emotions, and we might manifest or like believe in different solutions because of it, but it's the same fundamental feelings. And I think if we can get in touch with that, like, that's such a better way forward to to, to, like, yeah, I I was looking at the sign right there. But it's true. Like that's that's such a more grounded and peaceful way to exist as human beings than like this constant battle within ourselves and then against each other. Because ultimately, like I think most of these battles we fight against each other is because of the ones we have in ourselves. One hundred percent. And this plays right into voluntarism. You think about self ownership from Mm -hmm. a physical level. This is self ownership on a metaphysical Mm level. Level. And really, I would say the metaphysical. Um, components or aspects of life are far more important and Mm -hmm. actually underpin the physical reality. Yeah, completely agree. And I know that that's like, that's not a common conversation, at least in my corner of the internet, but I think it's so fundamental because like our inner experience really is reflected in the outer experience. And like you look around the world and you see how the average person is doing like in their personal life and the feelings they're feeling. And it's not great. And like, understandably so, but this comes from so many levels. And like, the point isn't like, well, you have to like pull at every single thread and figure out why you feel this way and why you feel that way. Like, that's kind of irrelevant. The point mm-hmm. is that you become aware of it and you start living from a, like a heart and spirit based reality. And like, like that's how you view it. Or at least that's yeah. how I try to view and even, it now. And even if you're, if you view all of that as woo woo and you mm-hmm. view the idea that your thoughts and feelings and beliefs create your reality, you can look at it like, okay, if you have perpetually negative thoughts, mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned like on a biological level, mm-hmm. the cortisol that is released when you're in mm-hmm. a perpetual state of fight, flight or freeze. But even so you, you look at, you know, uh, 
many people can refer back to this, like a grumpy grandparent who was just <laughs> constantly negative the whole time mm -hmm. that actually had real world implications for mm -hmm. how they showed up in the mm -hmm. world. And I think that we as self-professed voluntarists and those of you who are listening to this who are self-professed voluntarists really are doing a disservice to ourselves mm -hmm. and to others who are trying to get to adopt these self-ownership beliefs mm -hmm. when we're not taking 100% ownership and responsibility for our emotions. And as you said in your presentation, it's not in a Ben Shapiro-like way where it's like, I think you quoted him as saying like, fa your, uh, facts don't matter, feelings don't matter, something like, like that. facts like, don't care about yeah, feelings. Yeah, facts don't care yeah. about feelings. And mm -hmm. it's not in that context. It's that you need to process and feel mm -hmm. your shit at is at as it arises so you're not projecting it onto other people mm -hmm. and i think that allows us to communicate these principles in a more grounded way mm -hmm. to where people feel empowered to become voluntarists and they're not like oh i feel like a moron because i've been a status my whole life right. and you're telling me i'm a moron mm -hmm. it's like oh, you know what? That feels good. That feels right, right. to be voluntary. It feels good in my body. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting as you're talking about that. I recently learned about the negativity bias. It's like this concept that as humans, negativity is like built into our brains, hardwired into how we function as a survival instinct. Like, And it was, I was reading this in a book called Hardwi Hardwiring Happiness. And he talks about like, when we were hunter gatherers, we, I'm like talking that when people were hunter gatherers, <laughs> uh, I was not there. Two weeks ago, <laughs> when I was a hunter gatherer. <laughs> right. Like it was safer. Like if you heard a rustle in a bush, it was safer to assume that was a tiger and like maybe be anxious for a little bit and run away and survive than to assume it wasn't a tiger and potentially die. Mm -hmm. So our brains are built to perceive the negativity, like just as a matter of survival, but that kind of like runs amok, especially in a status system like that. So it's very easy to constantly see the threats and see all the stress and latch on to that. But it is possible to like on a neurological level, like rewire your brain to not like, you're not gonna get rid of the negativity bias, but to counter it, like to see the good, to enjoy the good, like to soak it in and take it in. This is all from the book. He's, I mean, it's not talking about statism, but he's talking about neural pathways and rewiring it relates, them. Though. Yeah, yeah it, it does relate. And it's yeah. like, if you're like feeling super stressed out about, you know, something you saw on the news, look at the sky. Oh my God, there are clouds out there. And like, not only is it beautiful for a second, you can soak that into your whole body. Like it's so simple and it's really hard to do. So funny like, you say that because you know, like when, if I've spent a lot of time on my phone and I'm like sucked into some drama or something, yeah. I've had the exact same thought where I'm like, damn, the world is dope. Like, right. this is cool. I'm yeah. just laying, looking at clouds in my backyard yeah. with my son lying on my yeah. arm. I'm like, damn, this is actually dope as hell. It's really yeah. not that bad. And it's like, how much, how do we, how do we, where do we draw the line between being aware of what's going on and being mm -hmm. sucked into what's going right. on in the world? And I think it comes back to uh, how you feel in your body. Exactly. Exactly. It's like just being mindful, like getting in the habit of paying attention to how your body feels. And it's really hard to get into it at first, but the more you do it, the more second nature it becomes. And like, the point isn't just like, oh, it hurts in my heart, so I got, I got to get rid of it. No, it's just like, okay, yeah, no wonder that hurts. This is a really difficult thing to, to be witnessing or paying attention to. Right. Like, re like, don't turn it away. Like, it's not a bad thing, it just is. Mm. But turning it away, like, it does start to wreak havoc, like year after year, like every single day when you live in that state. And I, I'm speaking from experience. And I'm, I'm, this is still a practice for me, like, to be clear. Like, I don't want to speak like I have it all figured out. And like, I, I never have a negative thought. Like, yeah, right. And it's having those negative thoughts and experiences to me has become such a great way to practice this. Mm. Like, Ooh, cool. Like there's some sensation there. Like, what's it telling me? Like, how can I be kind to it? Mm. And then naturally it's like, as soon as you stop trying to force it to go away, when you just accept it, that's actually like when it does start to melt away. Yeah. You just feel it. And then it's gone yeah. <laughs> afterwards. And it's so empowering because you realize that you are not your thoughts, mm -hmm. feelings, and emotions, and that they don't actually have power over you. And it can seem just like the Wizard of Oz, something very big, bad, and scary, but it really is like a little man behind the curtain, mm -hmm. just like the government is. Yeah. And it's, you just need to feel it. You yeah. just need to experience it, name it, and feel it, and then it goes away. Yeah. And That's it'll probably it come back, and then you feel it again. Yeah. And then, you know, and like over time. It gets time, easier, though. Yeah, exactly. Because when you stop judging it, like it, it becomes safer for it to arise. And that's actually been my experience is like when I stop judging and like pushing away, more comes up and I'm like, oh no, it's never gonna end. But like you do reach, like it just becomes part of the human experience, which to me, yeah, it's, it's hard in the moment. It's hard to have feelings, but it's so much harder having lived both ways. It is 
exponentially harder to ignore them and to pretend like they don't exist and to run from them. And it mm. causes so many more problems. Just like uh, statism indoctrination starts in the home when we're younger, when our parents are just in a, a very authoritarian way telling us what we should do and shouldn't do. And, you know, for some parents, uh, you know, beating the shit out of their kids. And then when we go to school and we're being told what we are supposed to do, being mm -hmm. told when to sit, when to stand, when we can use the restroom or not, et cetera, et cetera. I think that this also starts when we're younger as well, mm -hmm. because for a lot of us, it's undealt with trauma mm -hmm. that then creates a situation where we're projecting mm -hmm. our undealt with, our unprocessed emotions onto other people. And I think that government itself is the mechanism that allows a lot of trauma traumatized mm -hmm. people to project it onto the world under the guise of you know doing the right thing yeah absolutely and i think that applies both to the voter and like the, the government employee i'm not saying like your average like dmv employee is out like causing active harm maybe like i disagree with the whole system i, I don't, don't like my registration re but i feel <laughs> yeah. you on that <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> I get it, I get right like but like the average cop like probably some part of them wants to help, but there's also this unconscious desire to control or like to make up for being bullied. And I mentioned this in the talk, actually, I listened to a podcast. It was either John Kabat-Zinn or Jack Kornfield, but he had worked with veterans and they were traumatized from like being overseas and being in combat. But the deeper work he did with them, the more he found out they were traumatized going into the military. And that was their way of like trying to take back agency or power or like a sense of strength after being abused or like beaten down in childhood. And it like, that's innocent. What they ended up doing at war, this is not what he said, this is my opinion. What they ended up doing overseas, not innocent, you know, like committing violence, but it totally. came from such a wounded place. And like, that's what I have compassion for. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, uh, you know, speaking specifically to the military, because I was in the military mm -hmm. and thank God I didn't deploy. That is absolutely yeah. the experience, especially for people who enlist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in large part, people who become officers like I was, it's, it's really the same thing. It's, it's undealt with experiences and un um, acknowledged experiences and emotions from childhood that lead them to even sign up to join the army and i think for a lot of enlisted people it's in it's an escapist mentality where it's yeah. like this was a shitty situation mm -hmm. in this shitty town i don't like my shitty friends here so i'm gonna escape and go yeah. go join the military and make myself better um but it, it's uh the the compassion piece i want to circle back to that because i think that when you look at um, let's, let's take someone, uh, as an example right now, that's, that's prevalent and it's like Netanyahu, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is very, very hard for me to have compassion yeah. for Benjamin Netanyahu. And at the same time, especially when I was engaging with everything after October 7th, mm -hmm. it's like me being glued to hating Benjamin Netanyahu is only going to perpetuate yeah. me feeling worse, which yeah. then makes me engage with my reality in a way that is perpetuating negativity and anger. Right. And that's not to say that we shouldn't call him out for what mm -hmm. he's doing, mm -hmm. but it's how, how do you truly come to compassion for like the worst of the worst evildoers? Another one would be Anthony Fauci. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. And like, I think it's important to not deny legitimate feelings about it. Like, it doesn't help to like scold yourself or judge yourself for like feeling that anger toward them yeah. or feeling that judgment toward them because that's how you feel. Like, mm -hmm. if that doesn't mean that you have to like put it back out into the world. Like, but you may need you to feel. at some point say like, I fucking hate Benjamin yeah, Netanyahu. For sure. Like, right. what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Yeah. Like, but it, but I think there's just as much value for yourself to then like bring in that piece of compassion of like, well how did that guy grew up? What stories was he told? Because right. something I see actually about the, like, I see a lot of Jewish people who can just rationalize what the Israeli government is doing. And like, that could be a whole other podcast, but what I see happening a lot, and I'm half Jewish, like I've heard, and this is what happens is so many Jewish people grow up hearing stories of extreme persecution of like, like, okay, well, my family was running from Cossacks in Russia and pogroms. And the other part of my family was getting rounded up into camps. And so what does the government then do? They exploit that trauma. And they call it compassion. Like, we'll have compassion for us. And then somehow they use that to divorce people from their compassion for other beings going through just as severe trauma. And that's, I've kind of sidestepped, but like, I see the dynamic here. And it's like, so I understand, I completely disagree with these Jewish people. They are misguided. They've been misled. They need to like get a grip. And like, I, I actually have more videos about this because like, 
The one you made on like, quote, Israel's right to exist was so good. <laughs> Thank so you. So good. I was so scared to post that one. Honestly. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> I was like, well, it's also helpful because you're like, look, I am Jewish too. And right. I'm telling you that this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, yeah. And that's the thing is like, it comes back to that collectivism and like, we are the government. So you have the Israeli government acting like the shepherd of Jews. Mm. And it, like, that's so problematic on so many levels from like a voluntarist and just like human being standpoint. But like, I can have compassion for why Jewish people would fall for this. Yeah. That doesn't mean I have to agree. And like, I am in a unique position as someone with like Jewish family to speak mm. about it. Like, no, no, not even then. Yeah. Did people in my family die? Were they persecuted? But pretty sure. Yeah. Based on the history you have. Okay. That doesn't make it okay to like divorce yourself from compassion for other human beings. Like if I don't understand how you can have that in your family history, grow up hearing stories about that and then be like, Oh, but so we have to do it to somebody else. Right. And it's, like, literally, it, it's so crazy. And I don't want to go off on a huge right, tangent on Israel, Palestine, but like, but I feel, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like literally what's happening to people in Gaza right now mm -hmm. is on, you could say on a smaller scale, but who knows how it'll pan out over time. Mm -hmm. The exact same thing that was happening to Jewish people mm -hmm. in the 1930s and 40s, literally the exact same thing. Yeah. And like, I think like to bring it back to compassion, this happens because it's not there. Right. These horrible atrocities can be committed, can, can, committed because we're divorced from that because the propaganda gets us so scared, like so isolated, so caught in like our reactivity that we can't access that because actually on a biological level, again, like when you're caught in fight or flight, your brain is literally deprioritizing those things. It's like, well, that's not necessary for, for survival. I got to focus on like living literally like I got to survive. So there's no time to have compassion for people who are suffering. Like that's not essential to my survival. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're caught in that, like good luck with the compassion. And of course, like you can rewire it, but like if you're not consciously aware of it and you're not trying, it is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So like all the more reason that it is so important, like for your individual well-being and for actual transformation in the world, because to me, government is the antithesis of compassion. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't care how you feel. I don't care what you want. Meaningless to me. Do what I say. Right. Like <laughs> when it comes to compassion related to voluntarious, you know, us, and I've struggled with this a lot, looking at people in the freedom community who still believe in voting, who are like super MAGA or are behind RFK and are putting all of their eggs in that basket. I, how, how have you approached compassion for people who are still engaging with that? Especially because I think what makes it most frustrating is that they're almost there and mm -hmm. I consider them my people. And then it's hard for me because yeah. I'm like, I, you're so misled on that topic. Yeah. And I perceive that you're still helping to perpetuate the right. whole mechanism that is creating all of these issues. So like, how have you come into compassion for those in the freedom community that fall into that category? And why is it important for us to have compassion for them? Yeah. Um, well, I'm definitely still working on this myself. <laughs> I am too. Uh, like, I think I struggle with this more than like Benjamin Netanyahu, yeah, ironically, right. which is so crazy. Right. Because it's so frustrating because they're so close. Right. But I like for me, it comes back to like compassion for myself because I think like it's kind of ironic because I think the reason they resort to this is because what we would call a status, like they show no compassion toward us. Mm. But then it becomes just this like tennis match of like ping pong of like, well, you have to rise above it at some point. Like, yes, I can bring myself to that level and be like, no, those people don't deserve, deserve compassion. They're so wrong and so misguided. Like, they're completely missing the point and this and that. And again, like, I'm allowed to feel that way. And like, how does it feel to not have compassion? It sucks. Like, to look at so many people who wanted me, like, kicked out of public places for being unvaccinated because they were so scared. And it's like, well, they were really scared. Yeah. I still think they're wrong. They're completely wrong and, like, violating fundamental freedoms on so many levels. But, like, they're terrified. Like, what did I expect them to do? And I think like I can apply that to the people who are so close, but not quite there. You right. know, it's like they're they're suffering with this lack of compassion from other people. So I can give it to them because I see how like they're scared. Right. And I, I'm sure a lot of them would say, like, I'm not scared. No, I'm just rational. I don't have feelings. But again, I go don't... back to, OK, right. sit 100 of them down in a room and right. ask them the true reason that they're voting. And I guarantee right. it's because of some fear that may or may not happen. Right. And it's, I think it's that lack of awareness of the fear that then perpetuates this cycle. Mm -hmm. As soon as you bring it into your awareness, like it loses a lot of its power. Does it go away? Like probably not, but it stops running the show. It's mm -hmm. not in the driver's seat and you stop playing into that game. Yeah. So for me, like it is a constant practice. And there are days where like, 
I don't practice. Like I'm just <laughs> like I'm mad at right. everybody, you right. know. But like, but again, then don't hop on social media exactly, and say something or exactly. yeah, project it on. Then other I have people. so many like saved drafts of tweets where I like type it out and I'm like, just sit on that. Same, I, literally the same <laughs> exact way. Like maybe don't right. go there, right? And, and then the I don't, you know, because like, it's is it helpful? No, no. Like, is it going to change that change anyone's mind? Probably not. Yeah. Like maybe somebody, and I think that's also a fine line of like, because my mentality has always been like, well, if it changes one mind, it was worth it. Right. But it's also like, well, but how does it make me feel to say that? Because I've had so many like, mean is it changing comments. your mind in the right. present moment? Exactly. Right? And in what way? Like, right. am I changing it for the betterment of my well-being or is it dragging me back down? Right. And it, like, it really comes for me. It's like back to the self-compassion. Well, how would I feel in that position? If I if I were afraid of that, well, what would I do? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm still going to try to convince them otherwise. Like, that's like one of my biggest purposes in life is to change minds in this evolution of consciousness. But like. Again, like how is me being like angry and fearful and judgmental, like embodying all the qualities of the state and how it rules over people like that just that doesn't align for me anymore. Right. And I think like in a practical example, you look at someone again who's wanting to vote for Trump because they believe that is the best way to achieve freedom. Right. If you can really put yourself in their shoes mm -hmm. and listen to where they're coming from, mm -hmm. you can at least say you know what? I see where you're mm -hmm. coming from with that. And I can see why you'd think that. Exactly. And I have a little bit of compassion for you rather than immediately when you come across a Trump supporter being right. like, that dude's a fucking idiot. I'm right. not going to listen to what he says. And there are some people in some context where I'm like, oh my God, yeah. that's how I feel. But I think really catching ourselves and taking mm -hmm. responsibility for our own stuff and right. not projecting that onto other people allows us to then better communicate with mm -hmm. them and understand where they're coming from and maybe help them see it in a completely different way. Right. But I think you it first starts with having compassion, putting yourself in other people's shoes to see where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I think in the long run, that like disarms them more in a way where they're more willing to listen to you and they're more receptive because they don't feel like you're denying their experience. Like you're like, oh, I see you. I see that you feel that way. Like, of course you feel that way. And it's, I love what Larkin Rose does to bring it back to my like fangirling for Larkin, mm -hmm. like his candles in the dark seminar. Like one of the biggest premises of it is like, you're not telling people to change their beliefs. I mean, obviously like you're trying to change their beliefs, but one of the best ways to do that is to show them how their existing morals and values are incompatible with the state. Right. You don't have to change their morals and values because most people have the same ones. It's just there's this veil of statism, like mucking it all up and, and you know, misleading people into believing that it actually does represent their values. Yeah. I said that to Michael Rechtenwald, too, when I interviewed him the other day. I was like, I think the overwhelming majority of people are voluntarists and they just don't know it mm -hmm. yet. They <laughs> truly are. Yeah. yeah. Man, this has been an awesome, awesome, awesome <laughs> conversation. Carrie, where can people find more of your work? And will you be doing anything related to nervous system health to, to help people? I think the deeper I get into it, the more I'll talk about it. Yeah. Like I like, I want to, I want to dive a like little deeper in my own Because like framing that in a work. context yeah, for really. your audience would be huge. Yeah, like self I already love your video. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, you can find me on, you know, the usuals, Instagram, Twitter. I don't know if Odyssey is still, I feel like I saw that Odyssey is no longer up or like maybe it's not a still thing anymore at all i don't want to spread disinformation okay. <laughs> so, or it would be misinformation because it's not intentional i just but got like, really triggered yeah. <laughs> um yeah you can find me on all the usuals i'm on youtube totally shadow banned there um but yeah I've, i have a large volume of videos and there will be more soon to come awesome as i evolve <laughs> awesome <laughs> thank you so much carrie thank you so much for having me it was a great talk So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? 
Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one -on -one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby, as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off grid in nearly all cases with modern health systems you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with the doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects if this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the New Biology Clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes physically and metaphysically. Members of the New Biology Clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code THEWAYFORWARD for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of The Way Forward, email hello at thewayforward.com to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here.